Starting off at number 10, the Ark of the Covenant's location. The Ark of the Covenant was a lavishly decorated box with tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. It was said to possess incredible powers and had the ability to zap the lives of anyone who touched it or tried to look inside of it. Now, one theory is that the Ark was relocated to Egypt. It then allegedly made its way to Aksum, Ethiopia, and that's where it is today. So you would say that, well, the mystery has been solved, right? Well, not exactly, because while the Smithsonian claims that the monastery in Aksum, which has the Ark inside of it, but no one is actually allowed to go inside and see it for themselves. It's believed that there is just one person who can see it and everyone has to just take their word for it. The moment that this person, who is a virgin monk, takes this oath, he then enters into the Ark's compound and is not allowed to leave until he passes away. His only purpose is to worship. So after he passes away, another person takes his position. So this way, no one knows what's actually in there. The next mystery is of the lost tribes of Israel. The ancient Israelites were divided into 12 tribes. However, there are modern people all over the world who claim to be direct descendants of some of these lost tribes. According to the Bible Odyssey, Richard Brothers wrote in 1794 that England was the home of the lost tribes and that he was their prophet. Even though he was actually writing this from an insane asylum, still a lot of people, they gravitated to this idea. And also, according to PBS, the Japanese as a whole, as well as groups in China and Crimea and Afghanistan and the Caucasus, as well as Kenya and Zimbabwe in Africa, are also thought to be a lost tribe. There is also a group of Jews in India, and they have some evidence that they are in fact a lost tribe. There was a genetic study that was published in the year 2016, and it discovered that they share some genes with Jews, but they don't share any with any other Indians. Moving on to number eight, where is the Holy Grail? Even though it actually defies some sort of logic to try and save a cup that was used by Jesus at the last Passover meal, well, people always have been fascinated with the idea of the Holy Grail. It became a popular theme in medieval literature and legend has it that the Holy Grail was either buried in England by Jesus' uncle or taken from the Holy Land by the Knights Templar. BBC reports show that there are more than 200 places in just Europe alone that claim that they have possession of the Holy Grail. And also, as recently as the year 2014, there was a new cup that was declared to be the Holy Grail. So which one is the real Holy Grail? I guess this is probably one of those things that no one will ever really know. Number seven, this mystery is where is the lost Bible, or I should say the lost books of the Bible. Now, it wasn't until around 400 AD that the Bible was codified. There were many books considered holy or important by both Jews and Christians before that, and some of them did not make the final cut to be included in the Bible. Now, we do have many of these books today, but others were never published and are now completely lost. We only know about them because there are certain mentions in various different books of the Bible, like around 22 lost books are estimated to be out there somewhere or maybe lost forever. And throughout the Old Testament especially, there would be certain parts that say, and of course you can find this information in such and such a book, but there is no longer such and such a book. According to the Bible, these lost books contain histories of various different kings and prophets and genealogies and songs and things like that. The mystery at number six is about the Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, Moses requests that the Pharaoh let his people go from Egypt, but of course Pharaoh refuses. Terrible plagues then fall on the Egyptians and eventually the Pharaoh gives up and says, okay, take your people, go. 
But Pharaoh, of course, he changes his mind and he attempts to chase the Israelites and persuade them to come back. And he then forces Moses to, of course, perform that famous miracle of parting the Red Sea so that the Israelites can get to the other side. However, the name of this Pharaoh is not mentioned in the Bible at all. There are no Egyptian records of this event also. And there are different movies that were made about the Pharaoh and often he's referred to as Ramesses II or Ramesses the Great, but no one can say if this is 100% true or not. In at the number five spot, we have a talking donkey. This takes us to the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verses 21 to 39. A man by the name of Balaam, he takes a ride on his donkey, and the donkey, he notices an angel blocking the path ahead, and three times this happens, and he's beaten by Balaam for refusing to continue, but the donkey's scared to go. The Bible does say that after the third time, God opened the donkey's mouth, and God gave the donkey the ability to then speak. But the Bible, however, doesn't make any mention of this power being taken away from the donkey. And the story of Balaam and his donkey raises numerous questions, none of which are fully answered. Was a donkey, for example, a rational, sentient being who simply couldn't really express itself beforehand? Or was Balaam given the ability to understand the donkey and what the donkey's noises meant? Similar to that movie, Dr. Doolittle, where he can, he can understand animals. So could the donkey speak? Was Balaam given the ability to hear the animal? Did both happen? Did the ability of the donkey to talk leave it? Still a mystery. Number four leads us to the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Las Vegas, of course, may call itself the city of sins, but back in the day, the two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were the most sinful. They were so bad that, according to the Bible, God had to completely destroy them. As a matter of fact, the tale of these cities mentioned in the Old Testament are also mentioned in the Quran. And the main sins of these cities was the sin of homosexuality. But we don't know where on earth that these two cities actually were located in or whatever happened to the people there. According to Britannica.com, Sodom and Gomorrah are possibly located under or adjacent to the shallow waters south of Al-Lisan, which is a former peninsula in the central part of the Dead Sea in Israel. So the Bible records say that all the people were completely destroyed and gone, but did people live there after that? And where exactly were these cities located? The next mystery is, can the witches raise the dead? According to Leviticus 19.31, witches will defile people, and there's other verses that emphasize that they are evil, they are controlled by Satan and all of that. So yes, according to the Bible, witches exist and they have powers, but the Bible warns to stay away from them. Except for a time when Saul, the king of Israel, who was supposed to be a holy king, he actually went to see a witch and she completely summoned a dead spirit of the great Hebrew prophet Samuel. Some say that it was a demon disguising himself as a prophet Samuel, or was it? The mystery at number two involves Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog are the two great nations of earth that Satan will one day rally to his cause, leading to the day of judgment, according to the book of Revelation. Although Revelation 1-1 says that the prophecies in this book will happen very, very soon, well, it seems like people have been waiting a long time and they're not sure that if this is going to happen in the future or has it happened already. Either way, one of the most popular legends associated with Gog and Magog is that of Alexander's Gate. It's said to have been built by Alexander the Great to imprison these uncivilized and barbaric people of Gog and Magog until the end of time. And that's when this wall will be broken down and they will wreak havoc on Earth. So is this something that's going to happen in the future? or not? Is it happening? Who are the people of Gog and Magog? Where is Gog and Magog? So many mysteries around that. The mystery in at the number one spot is the Nephilim. Did they die in the flood? The common belief is that the Nephilim were created by the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men, according to Genesis chapter 6. And the King James Version of the Bible calls them giants. God destroys the entire earth in a flood, drowning everyone that isn't in Noah's Ark. But the Bible in later books 
includes a report on nearby land that some of the Israelites visited where the Nephilim still live. And they have grown so large that the Israelites appear to them as grasshoppers. So it is still unknown if there are Nephilim still roaming the world in the form of giants. And if they were, well, weren't they killed in the flood? And number 10, where is Eden? You know, the Garden of Eden mentioned with Adam and Eve. You know, they led a beautiful life in the Garden of Eden until they ruined their blessings and introduced sin into the world. But where exactly is Eden anyways? No one's really sure. In the Bible, it is stated that a river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there, it divided and became the source of four rivers. And the name of the first river is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Now the name of the second is Gion, which flows through the entire land of Cush. Now the name of the third one is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates, as it's mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 10 to 14. But no one knows where the first humans experienced Eden and precisely where the garden is actually located. Two of the four rivers mentioned in the book, Tigris and Euphrates, they exist and we know where they are today, but the other two haven't 100% been confirmed. Guesses are that Eden is in the Middle East based on the river Tigris and the river Euphrates, but no one knows 100% for sure. Now moving on to number nine, do dinosaurs exist as well as other creatures? Okay, so modern science has found proof for the existence of dinosaurs, but the Bible doesn't talk about them as modern education does. In the Bible, two creatures are mentioned that are monstrous in size and have supernatural characteristics unlike the animals we know today. Could this be in reference to dinosaurs or maybe some other type of creature? One of the creatures is behemoth, that's described as a beast to be feared and which can only be killed by God's sword. Now the other is a multi-headed beast called Leviathan. And in the Old Testament, Leviathan appears in the book of Psalms chapter 74 verses 14 as a multi-headed sea serpent that is killed by God and given as food to the Hebrews in the wilderness. So as you and I both know, this planet, we see some pretty interesting and strange looking creatures from time to time. But the one described in the Bible, they seem to have otherworldly origins. Moving on to number eight, how did the giants come to an end? So giants have been mentioned in the Bible quite a few times. In the book of Genesis 6 verse 4, it said, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in onto the daughters of men and they bear children to them. The same were the mighty men that were of old, men of renown. Now there there are a few questions that this passage brings up. Why do people not grow to be giants now? Especially it says that giants lived in the world after that. And what specific race of people was it talking about? Now there's many different interpretations that exist out there about the Nephilim, who they are, where they're from, if they exist or not. But not much is really found about them in the Bible specifically. Now from there, let's look to number seven, evolution. Evolution, the change in the characteristics of a species over several generations is a very common believed concept today. But in the Bible, there is just no mention of evolution. It's mentioned that God created all life from man to animals alike, but there is no description of the evolutionary process and its biblical mystery. Was there evolution or not? Now for number six, what are Adam? Just like there's no specific mention of evolution in the Bible, there's also no mention of atoms that are the building blocks of matter. The Bible has left a discovery of many of these smaller units of matter up to modern science and education, and there's no specific reference to them in the Bible at all. There, however, is a passage in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse three, which says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. This passage points to the idea that there are unseen forces behind everything that we see. So does it mean that there's something beyond atoms that work as a framework of everything that we see? And what else has science not discovered yet? 
Halfway into number five, let's talk about alien life. This is a very popular subject. Now, number six just alluded to this when it mentioned worlds, you know, plural for world, but it doesn't mention life on those worlds. Today, scientists are spending a whole lot of money and resources on finding traces of alien life and communicating with them. Although up until now, there have been some UFO reports and conspiracy theories, there is actually no proof, no concrete prove that life exists beyond our planet. But in the Bible, outside of the mention of angels living in heaven, there's no specific mention about aliens or life beyond our planet that live on other planets out there. If there is life out there, will we ever know? The mystery at number four is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is a chest that is supposed to have had the tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. Now, whether it was destroyed or captured or hidden, nobody really knows for sure. One of the most famous claims about the Ark of the Covenant and where it is that before the Babylonians completely ransacked Jerusalem, it had found its way all the way to Ethiopia, where it still is today in a town of Aksum in the St. Mary of Zion Cathedral. Number three, this mystery involves where the Holy Grail is. Where is it actually? Now, if you're not familiar with the term, the Holy Grail is the chalice that Jesus used at the Last Supper to drink from. He served wine in it and gave it to his disciples and all of that, and it really holds a lot of value for Christians. They believe that it was buried in England by Jesus's uncle or taken from the Holy Land by the Knights Templar. But in the Bible, there is actually no hint about the location of the this chalice. According to BBC, they have stated more than 200 places in Europe alone that claim they are in possession of the one true Holy Grail. But the Bible has no answer of its location, nor does it mention if it really exists or not. Now, moving on to number two, another popular subject having to do with the end of the world. There's a whole lot of detail about the apocalypse in the Bible, specifically in the last book, Revelation. Now, it says that the world will end and everything in it will be laid bare and the last day will occur after a period called the millennium. Now, over the course, more than 80 documentaries containing the predictions of how the world will end, they have actually shed some light on the Christian scriptures, but there's actually no specific date or time of the world ending mentioned in the Bible. It's still a big mystery. And finally, at number one, how did people live so long in the Bible? In the Bible, we find mentions of people living for hundreds of years. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And that's found in the book of Genesis chapter 5 verses 3. Now, modern technology has been able to help people to live upwards of 80 to 90 years. And some people, they live to 100 years and beyond that, but not too far beyond 100 years. But so far, we have not seen people live for hundreds of years. Now, in the past eras, people tracked time differently. So is that the answer as to why people live so long? You know, if you tracked a shorter year, you can say somebody is 600, but to us, they could be 30 years old, let's say. But is that the explanation or is there more to this. All right, coming up at number 10, why do some popes wear red shoes? Interesting question. So throughout history, many popes have worn red shoes as it is said to memorialize the blood of Christian martyrs. But red shoes were actually a Roman status symbol well before the birth of Jesus, when only the aristocrats could afford the expensive dye to produce the vivid red color. After the advent of Christianity, cardinals and the pope adopted red vestments and the red papal shoes have been carried over from that time. Now, of course, the red shoes are not a mandatory part of the wardrobe, and some popes have simply chosen to wear black or brown leather loafers. Up next, what is the pope's salary? Money, money, money. Well, contrary to many beliefs, popes aren't raking big bucks into their personal bank accounts. While you can't exactly pull up the pope's salary online, the Vatican has confirmed that the pope is not a paid salary. 
However, the Vatican does have a budget raised largely through its museums and banks that covers all the day-to-day -day financial needs of the Pope, such as food, travel, clothing, and other living expenses, as well as the costs of Vatican upkeep and staff. All right, now, can the Pope have pets? Seems unfortunate, but true that the Pope and any other residents of the Vatican are not allowed to have pets. Now, this prohibition on papal pets hasn't always been in place. Some popes have reportedly kept a dog or a cat and even a canary, but more contemporary popes have respected the restrictions on pets in the Vatican. In fact, when Benedict XVI, a well-known animal lover, became pope, his beloved cat Chico was left in the care of the house keeper of his own private residence. All right, up at number seven, is the Pope allowed to grow a beard? Well, beards have become an increasingly mainstream look for men from all walks of life with the exception of the popes. Now listen, it's not specifically forbidden for the Pope to grow a beard. In fact, Pope Innocent XII, who passed away in 1700, was actually the last Pope to rock a beard. Since then, all subsequent Popes have just opted for a clean shaven face. Now this is likely because Roman canon tradition encourages clean shaven clergy so that facial hair doesn't disrespect the blood of Christ by grazing the communion wine. Ugh, that would be kind of gross, right? <laughs> All right, this next one is personal because I love vacations. And can the Pope take personal vacations? Well, being a spiritual leader to the world's more than 1 billion Catholics would be a very demanding vocation for anyone. So how does the Pope kick back and relax when the job gets to be a little too much? Well, don't expect to see the Pope downing a margarita on the beach in Mexico anytime soon, but they do definitely take some time off for some quiet rest and relaxation. The Pope actually has access to a vacation house known as Castel Gandolfo, a swanky summer residence in the hills about 25 kilometers from the Vatican, and it even has a pool. Popes have used Castel Gandolfo to escape Rome's summer heat for almost 400 years and have generally used their vacation time as you would expect, reading, praying, and composing religious texts. All right, up at number five in the halfway point in today's video, what happens when a pope passes away? Well, in modern times, a doctor first certifies that the pontiff is deceased and a Latin pronouncement is made. The Camerlengo, a cardinal who serves as the administrative head of the Vatican, is then summoned to confirm the Pope's passing through a series of rituals. Once the Camerlengo is sure that the Pope has indeed passed and is not just in a deep sleep, he destroys the ring of the fisherman worn by the Pope and historically used to seal papal correspondence, as well as any other papal seals. Then the Pope's quarters are sealed off and public and diplomatic announcements of the passing, including the ringing of the bells at St. Peter's, are made and funeral arrangements can begin along with the selection of the next Pope. Okay, this is a big one. This one was interesting. Can the Pope watch movies and TV? What do you think? Yes, the Pope can watch TV and or movies. In fact, the Vatican has its own film library with over 8,000 titles, as well as a tiny movie theater to show them in, which was converted from its former use as a chapel. However, don't picture the Pope curling up with some popcorn, binge watching Breaking Bad. Popple media viewing, at least the ones that are publicly reported, tend to be pretty tame. Of course, it would be perfectly acceptable for them to keep Keep up with their favorite sports games or the evening news on TV during their personal time as well. Now you might be wondering, what does the Pope eat and drink? Are there things they can and can't eat or drink? Well, the Pope is generally not limited by rules regarding food and drink. Some Popes have even brought in their own personal cooking staff to work in the kitchen, whipping up delicious dishes of pasta, pizza, strudel, and tiramisu. In contrast though, some Popes prefer to take their meals in the Vatican hotel dining room with other residents and generally favor very plain and simple meals. Now, in terms of drinks, there are no prohibitions on the Pope's consumption of alcohol and most Popes have occasionally treated themselves to the occasional highball, a beer, or a little bit of wine. Now, up at number two, the question, does the Pope ever dress casually? 
Now, it can be hard to imagine the Pope wearing anything but his trademark white robes, but does he ever get to dress down? The answer is yes, the Pope sometimes wears casual clothes, but to avoid damaging his image, the more ordinary outfits are usually kept out of the public eye. For example, if the Pope puts on sweatpants or a pair of jeans, he typically does so behind closed doors during his own personal time. And up at number one, famous question, does the Pope ever sneak out of the Vatican? Let's face it, it's lonely at the top and too often the strict security restrictions that limit their mobility and privacy have led many popes to sneak out of the Vatican, traveling incognito to avoid unwanted attention. Some of the more popular sneak outs include off the record trips to ski and hike in the Italian Alps, unannounced visits to local art exhibits, late night walks through Rome, trips to the optician to get a new pair of glasses, and even lunchtime hunts for the best slice of pizza in the city.